when we start this film, uh, we are basically a uh, computer problem. Sorry. Oh, One let second. me step in there while I while Rebecca. Yeah, go that. for it. I, I was just going to mention John Logan. Uh, he wrote some good stuff, and it was kind of a shame yeah. uh, that you know. I mean, he wrote Gladiator, and I don't know if you guys ever saw Rango, but I actually kind of love that with Johnny Depp as the cartoon lizard. And, oh yeah, yeah. It dude, it's really I underrated. Didn't, it. I didn't end up getting to see the whole thing. The dialogue is great, and you know he did uh, Penny Dreadful, which is one of oh, my favorite Showtime shows. That's it's a that's a great series. I like it a lot. Apparently, it's coming back again. Or there's like another part of it or something. I don't not the same characters. Right, but. right, right. That's one and of then I, Josh Hartnett's best things he's ever done. It's a great show. Uh, he did the screen adaptation for Sweeney Todd, which I really enjoyed. Hmm. So it was a really good, good, and I just think that they paired him with the wrong director. I mean, I, I really do. I mean, it, this guy had barely watched any Star Trek before Next Generation before he, he took on this project, which obviously you, you can tell in the, the, the film it was a big mistake. Yeah. Um, there's a – okay, yeah. We are going to get into all things that we find wrong and things that we love about this movie, right? Because – I, I always say your fandom should be strong enough that you can criticize it, but still love it as a whole, right? So, like, we might pick this movie apart. Well, we will pick this movie apart, actually. And and there will be things that we do not like about this movie, but there's going to be things that we do like about this movie. I'm sure that there is. So we will definitely get into all of that. Um, but I'm glad you brought out that that point about uh, the writer John Logan. Uh, he has done some great stuff, and and certainly like even the director. I mean, he he's he was also an editor on a lot of other projects, which I think maybe editing might have been his stronger point. Absolutely. Sorry. Two Mr. Oscar Stuart nominations. So. <laughs> yeah, like if if you're listening to this somehow, sorry. I think you should have stuck to editing, <laughs> but maybe directing not his strong point because. Uh, there's some things I probably would have done different, I guess, if they let me direct this. And I don't, never know why they didn't let Jonathan Frakes direct this. Like, he's done great work with Star Trek and other projects, and but they never even asked him. So there's that. Well, well we know he's coming back for Picard, so. Yes, indeed, which is uh, exciting, yes. too. I'm happy to see him come back, not only as Riker, but see him happy to direct a couple episodes, too. Yeah, whether there's any of the other people in the episodes he directs like he knows this franchise and he knows the character of Picard and I'm sure he can envision where he's going now and everything and I think he'll do really well oh yeah I, I agree I don't I can't imagine him not doing a good job directing you know Patrick Stewart as as Picard uh this movie opens up uh we are flying through space we land on Romulus in the Imperial Senate there's talk about this guy Shinzon and his Riemann forces. Um, they decide we're not going to team up with this guy. Um, there's like some arguing, discussion, whatever. One of the council members leaves behind an incredibly ridiculous looking amulet, uh, <laughs> which then opens up and showers everyone with green sparkles and then it, they all die. <laughs> so <laughs> the green sparkles are not good uh, as we get to here. I thought it was cool cool opening this movie up on Romulus uh, you know they've always been great villains like for the Star Trek franchise and you know our, our like arch arch nemesis kind of thing but um, oh. uh, I said the name of the movie it's a thing <laughs> I have a question Yo, go for it do they talk about Remus at any other point in the series? Did I miss that at some other point? This is a great question. Because I <laughs> had always wondered why there was a Romulus and not a Remus. But then it's like, okay, if there's Romulus and then they sent like the people they didn't like to Remus, like, you know, like a prison colony or something or whatever it was. But then they're also related to Vulcans and then some other, spe like, who was the original species that they all <laughs> anyway I got like real deep into it uh, asking myself these questions the other night and I had no one to answer them <laughs> yeah so okay and then I, so I know that uh, Mark you and Faye Mark I'm so sorry Steve why did I say Mark you and Faye um, I know are, are Star Trek nerds just like uh, just like we are so if you have further information definitely jump in here 
they do mention Remus, I think, one time in the original series, very briefly, because of that legend of Romulus and Remus. But as far as I know, this is the first time that they ever go into any detail about Remus being the sort of um it because it's it's locked into with, with Romulus it, it doesn't rotate so this is the first time that I can think of that they do mention Remus do, do you guys remember anything else that I am blanking on so for all intents and purposes this is the introduction of Remus and the, and the Reman people I know that Enterprise, uh, the show Enterprise, brought him up later to talk about the dilithium mines and, and okay. mentioned Remus, but that was obviously post post uh, this movie. Okay. Yeah, I um, yeah, I I cannot think of any other time that they really brought this up. So yeah, Brooke, as far as we all can figure out, this is the first time that they really talk about Remus and so being. She- Here's a quote, if you if you care. When writer John Logan came up with the idea featuring Remans as the villains of the 2002 film Star Trek Nemesis, he first had to explain to Rick Berman and Brent Spiner who exactly the Remans were. <laughs> so I don't. That's pretty strong evidence if you have to explain to the rest of your the writer of the show and, and a co-star that didn't know who Remans were. So yeah, I so as yeah, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a uh, weird thing to introduce so late in the series like this mm-hmm. after we've had the Romulans around since the original series. Um, so, and then to answer the other part of your question, Brooke, uh, as I recall the, the story of how the Romulans came to be was that they basically broke off from Vulcan. Um, when, when the Vulcans decided to ad- adopt this purely logical, um, way of life right. and and deny emotion and suppress emotion and devote themselves to logic. There were a group of people who did not agree. And this is going back like centuries and all that. And they basically left Vulcan and started their own um, uh, thing on, on Romulus and they became the Romulans. Yeah. Okay. As far as I know, that's how, the Romulans develop, which is why they are similar. Of course, they look very similar to Vulcans, but they have a different philosophy in life. You know, they're definitely much more modeled after like the Roman soldiers, whereas the Vulcans are definitely modeled after like a, a purely logical society. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. First time we're really learning about about Remus and Remans. It's kind of strange, but um so uh, after that uh, incredibly uh, wild opening, we then uh, jump to a much calmer setting. Picard's giving a speech. He's t- uh, basically he is giving a best man speech mm-hmm. at uh, Riker and Troy's wedding. I don't know about you guys. Definitely, I want to hear your thoughts. I-, I thought this was one of those moments in the movie where Picard was not acting like Picard. Like. His speech to me was very almost silly at parts, like when he's like, what about my needs? And he's telling Data to shut up and he's wanted to say that for 15 years. And he has told Data to shut up like in the series. So I I don't know. I I just thought this was a little silly, even for Star Trek, because Trek can get pretty silly. What uh, what did you all think of this of this like uh, wedding speech? Uh, I liked parts of it where he was talking about, you know, um. Riker being his number one and, you know, Counselor Troy being his friend and, you know, all that kind of thing. Like, that part was good, but yeah, the other bit... It, <laughs> Picard is too classy to do that. <laughs> to, to be making, you know, jokes like that. And besides, he should have said, shut up, Wesley, because that's just a better thing to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Faye, what about you? It's just so awkward, isn't it? And he's such an eloquent man. And it's the perfect opportunity for him to quote something beautiful, which is something you would expect from Picard. And he chooses it to say in a very whiny voice, what about me? What are you doing? Leave me alone. You're buggering off. What are you doing? (laughs) And and is it it too late? Well, actually, you're having a speech afterwards. Yes, it's too late. They are already married now. Um... (laughs) It's just 
very everything's very awkward about it none of the chemistry that we expect from the cast seems to be present at all mm-hmm. i, I yeah. think there's been situations in in the next generation where you see picard quote unquote let his hair down mm-hmm. and uh, for example the the episode where uh, he invites uh Guinan into the holodeck to live out the like the Dick Tracy detective <laughs> fantasy, and he uses that really horrible New York accent. <laughs> and, oh, and, sure. And you see that, and it's like, look, I, I understand what you guys are saying, and, and, and you, that's your Picard, and you want Picard the way you are, but we have to understand that there are some times where he's amongst just the, his core group of friends because these people are his friends now. Not he's not there as a commanding officer; he's there as the best man and best friend and i thought the speech was really selfish and it was all about him and all promoted data in the middle of the speech i didn't really understand that part but (laughs) i I don't i don't think it's too uncharacteristic i think us as the audience doesn't get to see that side of him so i can understand Mm -hmm. how it's awkward but i mean there are parts where picard you know just drops his guard and, and and tries to you know just do have fun and do his thing so Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can I can absolutely see both sides of that. You know, kind of trying to show Picard, like as you said, letting his hair down. I don't know. I I've watched this movie a couple times this week, and every time I watch this scene, I'm just like, oh, like I'm just a little cringy with it. But I I do like the very end where he does. He says that like they're his family, which I I I love that. You know, they they really are his family. Because by now, you know, his brother and his nephew have died. And so there's really no one left, like, who's a Picard per se. So, like, these people are his family. Yeah, I I, I did enjoy that bit for sure. And then, uh, so then uh, we got this wedding receptions in full swing. We got a little cameo from Whoopi Goldberg as Guinan. She says uh, 23 marriages uh, is her limit. <laughs> 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 Which I thought was very funny. Again, speaking to like how little we know about Guinan and how old she actually is. Uh, Worf is hungover, which is uh, very funny to me. And um, we get a little bit of Brent Spiner singing where uh, Data gives his gift to uh, Riker and Troy as he sings them a song, Blue Skies by Irving Berlin. What do you and, think uh, that Worf is problem with Irving Berlin is? Yeah. No did clue. You, did you no notice that? He was really upset by the fact that it was a Berlin song. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he, when he's that hungover and, slash drunk, because I feel like he was he's hungover from the day before, but probably drank some more, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> sure. That, I just, uh, that he's, it just really, that maybe Irving Berlin really just gets on his nerves. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he just really hates 1940s jazz singers. Like, yeah. it really bothers him. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's it is odd. Um, again, I, I don't know. These are just some odd choices for the characters here, in in my opinion. But we we do get past this uh, this whole wedding scene, and they do talk a little bit about how um, they're going to go to Beta Z for the Beta Zoid ceremony, where, as we know, everybody's naked. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, like, even uh, in the next scene when they're back on the Enterprise Bridge, they're kind of still talking about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Worf is like, I don't want to be naked. And everyone's like, oh, especially Picard is kind of like, Oh, you, you're a strapping, handsome guy. What are you afraid of? And meanwhile, I'm going to go to the gym because I'm old and flabby. And I'm <laughs> going to tone up a little bit here. Uh, here's where we kind of get the first MacGuffin to the story where they pick up a positronic signal and from the Calarin system, uh, which is the same signal that Data's brain has. They're going to go and investigate it. When they do get to the system, uh, they go to Calaris 3. They tell you it's an it's happened by a pre-warp civilization of people. Picard decides to go down to the planet because he wants to try out the brand new Argo. Jordy recommends they don't beam down because there's an ion storm coming. And then we get, uh, this is a problem scene here. Uh, Picard uh, calls Riker Mr. Troy when he leaves. No. And everybody laughs because apparently... Casual sexism is still alive in the 24th century. And, <laughs> and you know, it's like, it would have been great if it was uh, because he married a Betazoid that 
he would now have her last name or whatever. 